Jade Raymond of Assassin's Creed fame launched her new studio Haven exactly a year ago. And today, PlayStation delivered a preemptive strike and acquired it. Good morning, good Tuesday morning to you. I'm Shane Satterfield from Sifted, and this is Good Morning Gaming for March 22nd, 2022. The show is in our patrons' feeds bright and early every weekday morning and free on our YouTube channel for everyone else. You can find our flagship show Game Face by searching your favorite podcast service. You'll find the podcast versions of the rest of our content in the same feed you found this. You heard that right. PlayStation has purchased Jade Raymond's new studio, Haven, just a year after it was formed and before it shipped a single game. It will be Sony's first Canadian studio, which is great. But this goes against the grain of every studio acquisition PlayStation has ever completed. Normally, studios need to have several projects under their belts working directly with PlayStation before they're purchased. But not this time. Think back to Naughty Dog, Insomniac, Blue Point, Housemark. All of those studios had worked with PlayStation on multiple successful projects before being acquired. But that is not the case with Haven. What has changed Sony's stance to make it willing to accept more risk? According to its head of studios, Herman Halst, the project Haven is working on is mighty impressive. Sony was already funding an exclusive live service game from Haven, so it essentially provided the capital to start the studio in the first place. Here's a direct quote from Halst from an interview with Games Industry. You're right. We could have just carried on in the capacity of them being an external development partner. But what Haven has created is so exciting for us. There was just a desire to deepen that relationship. We've been very impressed with how Haven is coming together. It's just easier for us to invest in the team and game more deeply this way. It is a testament to the fact that we've been very impressed with the progress that Haven has made. They're actually exceeding a lot of the plans, including in terms of time, which very rarely happens in game development, let me tell you. So we thought, let's invest deeply and do this properly. Okay, so they're impressed with Jade, and her team and what they've accomplished in 12 months, which 12 months in development time isn't much. So they must have something pretty cool in their hands, which is really, really exciting. But there is more to it than that. Sony isn't stupid. It sees the writing on the wall. Xbox is a sleeping giant right now, patiently waiting for all its new studios to bear fruit. Eventually, it's going to be overwhelming and PlayStation needs to be positioned to compete. Buying Haven before it's even launched a successful game means you're getting it at a rock bottom price. And Jade and her team are certainly more than happy to be paid untold millions just 12 months after forming a company. That's unheard of. They're being paid large sums of money for basically a logo and a cool prototype of whatever it is that they're working on. Both sides win. And I can't think of a developer more deserving than Jade Raymond. Now, will it pay off? It's hard to tell, but the risk is minimal in a high-stakes game. And now for a couple more stories from the top of your sis. The only game announcement that could come with less surprise than Grand Theft Auto 6 is that a brand new Witcher game is in development. And that is exactly what happened today when CD Projekt Red announced, I should mention, not The Witcher 4, by the way a couple of their employees on Twitter clarified that they did not announce The Witcher 4 today. However, probably the biggest thing in the announcement is that the game is going to be built on Unreal Engine 5. And not just built on Unreal Engine 5, the game is going to shape how Unreal Engine 5 handles open world games going forward. The move to Unreal Engine 5 from CD Projekt Red's proprietary Red Engine is the beginning of a multi-year strategic partnership with Epic Games. It's a partnership. It's not just, hey, we're going to make our next game with Unreal Engine 5. Not only does it cover licensing, but also technical development of the engine itself and potential future versions of Unreal Engine where it's relevant. 
CD Projekt Red will work closely with Epic Games developers to help tailor the engine for open world experiences. Here's a quote from CD Projekt Red. From the outset, we did not consider a typical licensing arrangement. Both we and Epic see this as a long-term, fulfilling tech partnership. It is vital for CD Projekt Red to have the technical direction of our next game decided from the earliest possible phase, as in the past, i.e. The Witcher 3 and Cyberpunk 2077, we spent a lot of resources and energy to evolve and adapt Red Engine with every subsequent game release. This cooperation is so exciting because it will elevate development, predictability, and efficiency, while simultaneously granting us access to cutting-edge game development tools. I can't wait for the great games we're going to create using Unreal Engine 5. Probably the bigger news to fans of The Witcher is that CD Projekt Red announced that the new game, while it's not The Witcher 4, it will be kicking off a brand new saga in The Witcher franchise. This is really the best possible news all around. No more buggy games from CD Projekt Red. A new Witcher game is in development, though we have no idea when it's coming or what platforms it will be available for. Stay tuned. Hot on the heels of Unreal's big announcement with CD Projekt Red, Unity today unveiled an impressive tech demo called Enemies for GDC 2022. For those of you who don't know, GDC, the Game Developers Conference, is an annual conference where literally tens of thousands of game developers from all walks of life, the big AAA guys, the indie guys, everyone's there, they all get together and basically talk shop for three or four days in San Francisco. And this is when Unreal and Unity and engine creators tend to flex their muscles a little bit, and that is exactly what happened today with that Unity enemies tech demo. It is astounding. Unity claims the focus of the demo is on realistic humans, including hair and cloth textures, and man does it deliver. I've been doing this for a long time, and it is one of the most impressive tech demos that I have ever seen. So I highly recommend you check it out. You can find it on Sifted. It is curated to the site. Just search for Unity Enemies Tech Demo and prepare to have your mind blown. The first reviews for Shinji Mikami's new IP Ghostwire are in... And they're not great. Ghostwire Tokyo right now is sitting at roughly a 76 between the PC and the PS5 versions. Now, you're probably saying, Shane, come on now. 76 isn't bad. You're right. If you review games on a 10-point scale, which this industry does not do, you know as well as I do that a 7.5 is just slightly above average instead of the 5 that you would expect. So it's a little disappointing. While most reviews are praising its realistic rendition of the Shibuya district of Tokyo, just as many feel that the gameplay just isn't quite up to scratch. We'll be sharing our impressions of the game live today on Game Face. The stream goes up at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash siftedgames. We'll see you there. In a brand new update today, the Nintendo Switch finally received something users have been asking for for a long, long time. Folders. <laughs> Folders allow you to group apps together for a more organized home screen with less icons and clutter. It seems insignificant, and if you ask me, it kind of is, but it's a big deal for power users, so download the update and get organizing. Reliable Game Info leaker Tom Henderson's latest gigantic leak is of an upcoming Ubisoft Forward pre-E3 event where several long-awaited sequels will reportedly be announced, not the least of which is a new 2.5D Prince of Persia game in the same vein as the Ori and the Blind Forest franchise. The series started in 2D, and now it looks like it's returning under the experienced hand of the Rayman team. Sequels to Immortals, Phoenix Rising, and The Crew, which is Ubisoft's street racing franchise, and much more are expected to be shown among 20 different games. Again, this is all according to Tom Henderson, who has been very reliable in the past. We should also get the first deep dive into the Prince of Persia The Sands of Time remake, which is scheduled to be released in the next 12 months. Let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll tackle today's boss fight.
Welcome to today's Boss Fight, where I tackle random topics that may or may not be related to video games. Today, one of my colleagues and a former co-worker, and honestly, one of the best people that I've met working in my entire time in this industry, decided to call it quits. Brandon Jones of Easy Allies, and formerly of Game Trailers, where I worked for seven plus years, has decided that he's going to throw in the towel. He claims that he had made the decision at some point last year, but decided to announce it today, and he's going to wrap things up quickly. He says he's going to do as many podcasts and streams as he can. He wants to go out in a blaze of glory. And it's hard to understand why this is happening. I think for most people it would be, because I think... Most people who support things like Sifted and support things like Easy Allies, you guys are the hardest of the hardcore. There's just no denying it. If you're willing to pay a monthly subscription to get game information from people that you trust, you are in the vast minority. And thank heavens for you. Without you guys, there is no Sifted. I'm not sitting here right now doing Good Morning Gaming without people like you and people that support Patreons like Easy Allies. But still, a lot of people will look at the jobs that we do like a dream job. And I'm sure a lot of our patrons at Sifted think what I do is a dream job. And I'm sure a lot of Easy Allies patrons feel like what Brandon is doing or was doing would be a dream job for them. But it's not all cake and cookies and unicorns. And I know you've heard this before. But take a look around. How many games journalists do you see that are Brandon's age, my age? Not many. Why do you think that is? Look, I'm not going to pretend to guess why Brandon decided to step down. But as someone his age who has been doing it even longer than he has, I have some ideas. I think about this stuff all the time. And... Recently, there has been some health issues with Brandon's son, and while he says that the decision was made last year, it's hard not to at least wonder if some of the health-related stuff with his child helped nudge him to make the decision and pull the trigger on it. But why is there such an expiration date, it appears, on game journalists in the industry? I think it's a combination of factors, and again... I have not spoken to Brandon about why he's leaving. I just sent him a congratulatory text message, um, but we did not have a conversation about it. And so I don't have any inside information from Brandon about why this is happening. This is just all conjecture on my part based upon my experiences and what I've been living. It is a dream job. There's no denying it. If you had told me when I was 17 or 18 that one day I would be living in California and I would be essentially reviewing video games for a living, and I would have done it for 25 years. I would have said, you're crazy, but if you're telling me the truth, oh my god, I'm so freaking lucky. So don't think that it's lost on me how fortunate I have been, and Brandon was, to do what we've done for over two decades. But the reason people get out of it eventually is, one, there's kind of a ceiling... No one's going to get rich working in games journalism. It's just not going to happen. And, you know, not everyone is worried about getting rich, quote unquote. Some people are just more than happy to be able to make a living doing what they love. I know I fall into that camp. I've never been concerned about being rich. I always just hope that I could have an enjoyable life doing something that I enjoyed for a living. And that's happened. Now, it didn't happen on accident. It happened because I work my ass off. And I have worked my ass off since 1995 or 1996 when I was in college full-time at Temple University and running a gaming website full-time. While, I would add, working a normal job 35 hours a week. I did that for my last two years of college and then graduated with honors and then... Sure, okay, there was a little bit of luck involved getting my first job at GameSpot. But I was probably one of the first people 
to graduate with a journalism degree who had worked towards that goal versus working in sports journalism or any other form of journalism. So it wasn't handed to me, and it wasn't handed to Jones either. Jones had the foresight, and he had the motivation, and he had the work ethic to launch a startup, GameTrailers.com. And thank God he did. Because he started Game Trailers, and him and his crew of buddies who he had gone to school with his whole life, their project ended up getting purchased by MTV. How, I mean, I can't even tell you how awesome that is for someone from my generation. And then I get hired as the first person from the outside to come there and work. And it was intimidating going to work there for the first time. I knew no one there other than the people I had interviewed with. But the person who broke the ice was Brandon. He was the first guy to come up to me and try to have a real conversation. Not just, hey, you're Shane. Glad to have you here. Hope we do good stuff. Like, sit down and have a real conversation with me and try to get to know me. I will always remember that. Because you guys have all had first days on the job. You're nervous. You're afraid everyone's going to hate you. You're afraid you're going to make a stupid mistake. Or whatever. But Jones disarmed all that for me. He was the conduit. He took me around and introduced me to everybody because I'd only met a couple people during the interview process before they hired me. So I owe Jones so much. I mean, without my seven or eight years at Game Trailers, who knows what would have happened to my career. I would have stayed at G4 instead of leaving, and G4 only stuck around a couple more years after that. If I had stuck around at G4, who knows? My career could have been over. And that brings up why I believe you do not see a lot of older people in games journalism anymore, or ever really. It's a grind. It is a grind. It is a dream job that you have to do obsessively. You feel like you're always paying for the privilege to do it. I work... And I know people, I say this, and I'm sure it just goes in one ear and out the other, and people are like, oh, he's exaggerating. Everybody says they work long. I work 14 hours a day. Every day. That's Saturday, Sunday, every day. One day on the weekend, I may get a little time, but that time's going to be spent playing games, so does that count as work or not? I guess it does because I have to do it to be able to do the other stuff that I do. If I don't play the games, everything else I do is pointless. I won't be informed. I won't be good at my job. And it can burn you out. I have had so many horrible things happen since Sifted launched. Marcus Beer was supposed to be the co-host of Game Face. He lasted a handful of episodes and then didn't show up for our first live broadcast for E3. Had to call... Daniel Kaiser in at the last minute, and he had to do E3 with me through Skype. This was our first E3 after I spent tens of thousands of dollars to launch a company. A couple months after that, our studio gets broken into. We get completely cleaned out. Everything's stolen. A year and some after that, my dad and my sister die in a car accident. Couldn't take time to grieve. I just couldn't. If I had done that, my company would have died. And so I spent maybe three days sitting on that, and then it was back to work. We have lost our studio three or four times. We have had mass exodus of patrons and subscribers through COVID. It has been a battle. And I would be lying if there haven't been times where I was like, what am I doing? I'm too old for this crap. I have said it out loud to myself, I can't tell you how many times in the last six years that Sifted has been operating. And I know Brandon has said it too. And sometimes when you have a big life change, something that happens that puts everything in perspective, you make a big change. And that has happened for a lot of the older folks who have worked in games journalism. Look at other journalism fields. Look, watch CNN or any of the news networks. Look how old the people are that are still working there. Those jobs aren't easy either, but they are still there. Why is that? Because in those fields, experience 
expertise, knowledge are valued. That's not really the case with games journalism. People who are looking for information on games, they're not really seeking out someone that they know has been doing it for a long time. They're looking for someone who's entertaining, someone who's young, someone who looks like them. And so one, there just aren't a lot of jobs for people who get a little older in this industry. There's only a handful of editor-in-chief jobs. There's only a handful of supervising producer or executive producer jobs. And generally, those people that have those jobs, they don't leave. So eventually you hit the ceiling in this industry and you start to get aged out. When big gaming websites hire new people in high position roles, they are very rarely people who are experienced. They're someone who came from somewhere where they built maybe a big social media following, a lot of Twitter followers, maybe they built a big YouTube channel, they're an influencer, something like that. Those tend to be the people who get the jobs. And it's not hard to get the drift you realize very quickly that there aren't a lot of opportunities for older folks, and honestly, a lot of people just move on. So either you age out, and there just aren't any, any opportunities for you, or you burn out, or you do both. And so it's very difficult to be an older professional and stay in this industry. So a lot of people move to being consultants. They move to development in some way, or they work as a community manager for a studio. And the people who don't get those jobs just wash out and have to start over. I've seen several people that I looked up to when I started doing this who are now working at Walmart. And so it could be that Jones just realized that life is too short. It could be that he realized that his priorities were out of whack. It could be that the job just ground him to a pulp. More likely, it was all three, and he finally just said to himself, I'm too old for this crap. Thanks for listening to Good Morning Gaming. I appreciate every single one of you who listens to GMG. I'm Shane Satterfield, and you can do what the cool kids do and follow me on Twitter at Dinfire. And while you're at it, follow Sifted at Sifted Games. And while you're at that, head on over to patreon.com slash sifted and drop us a pledge so we can keep making this show for you. We'll be back with another episode tomorrow, but until then, make sure you seize today because there will never be another. Another.